to you may begin whenever you're ready. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, honorable members of the committee, for your invitation to appear today as you explore the topic of cyber threats to Canada's defense infrastructure. As uh, the chair has uh, just announced, I am joined by Senator Francis Lankin, who has been a member of ENSACOP since its inception. Um, the executive director of the Secretariat, Lisa Marie Inman, to my right, and Nabil Bachia, a review analyst with our Secretariat. It's our pleasure to discuss the special report on the Government of Canada's framework and activities to defend its systems and networks from cyber attack. It is a 127-page foundational report on cyber defense of government networks. Its time frame was between the years 2001 and 2021, 20 years chosen deliberately by the committee to help indicate the evolution of our cyber systems and networks. The National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians submitted this report to the Prime Minister on August 11, 2021, and it was tabled in Parliament on February 14, 2022. The review examined how the government defends its systems and networks from cyber attack. The committee conducted this review because of the importance of federal systems and networks, which form part of Canada's critical infrastructure. These networks store large amounts of personal information and are used to deliver essentially every government service. De plus, ils contiennent des renseignements sur les... They also store information on Canada's military operations, defense technology and equipment, as well as information about military strategies, intelligence and procurement plans. Le vol de renseignements concern... The theft of information about military operations could reveal strategies, targets and capabilities. This could jeopardize military operations, intelligence gathering, and the safety of Canadian Armed Forces personnel around the world. Les réseaux gouvernementaux et militaires font continue. Government and military networks are under relentless cyber attack by a number of states, most notably China and Russia. And networks may be vulnerable to malware and other forms of cybercrime. Aujourd'hui, le gouvernement fédéral est un chef de file. Today, the federal government is a world leader in defending its networks. Mais cela n'a pas toujours été le cas. But this was not always the case. In the 2000s and in the early 2010s, China and Russia conducted successful cyber intrusions against the Department of National Defense, or the DND. Still, in the early 2010s, China carried out damaging cyber attacks against 31 federal departments. This was a wake-up call in terms of the scale of the government's cyber vulnerability and its poor defenses. Since then, the government has incrementally developed a strong cyber defense system, both in terms of governance and technical capability. This brings me to our findings and recommendations. I'll begin with two findings. First, our report noted that over time, the government's approach to cyber defense evolved towards one that considers all government systems as a single enterprise. This horizontal approach has considerably improved cyber defense, although we found it is challenged by the vertical nature of accountability in the government. Deputy heads have a lot of leeway to reject government-wide horizontal cybersecurity policies and protections. Second, our report noted that not all federal organizations receive the same cybersecurity protection. There are two related reasons for this. The first is that the Treasury Board's cybersecurity policies do not apply to the entire government. And when they do apply, they do not always apply evenly. Second, departments are not obligated to adopt the cyber defense services offered by Shared Services Canada and the Communications Security Establishment. They are not obligated to do so. 
This means that many federal organizations are entirely outside the government's cyber defense perimeter, while others pick and choose services and do not subscribe to the full suite of government security services. These gaps and inconsistencies, we concluded, undermine the strength of the government's overall enterprise approach to cyber defense. The interconnectedness of government systems means that the government's cyber defense perimeter is only as strong as its weakest link. For example, our report noted that the Department of National Defense, or DND, is responsible for monitoring its own networks. While the committee did not examine DND or any other department's cybersecurity specifically, we are confident that departments which receive cybersecurity services from shared services and the communications security establishment are far, far better protected than those which do not. As we say in the report, CSE's dynamic defense tools are world class and they are constantly evolving to keep pace with the threat. Because we did not look into DND in depth, we're very encouraged to hear that your committee is considering a study of DND cybersecurity. Bringing more and more departments into the cyber defense perimeter that has been created by shared services and CSE creates a virtuous cycle. And this is how. As more departments subscribe to the government's cyber defense services, CSE obtains and analyzes more data, which allows it to better protect all the departments within the perimeter. Even though the protection offered by shared services and CSE will never block all threats, their combined cyber defense services offer the greatest likelihood of protecting government data and systems. With all this in mind, the committee made two recommendations. First, the committee recommended that the government continue to strengthen this enterprise approach to cyber defense while keeping up with evolutions in technology and the threat environment. Second, we recommended that the government bring all federal organizations into the cyber defense perimeter and provide them with the full range of cyber defense tools and that the cybersecurity policy suite should apply to all federal organizations, which isn't the case today. The government agreed with both recommendations. À vrai dire, le comité se réjouit du fait que... Indeed, we are pleased that, for the first time, the government provided an official response to our recommendations and that it did so again when our special report on Global Affairs Canada was tabled in November 2022. The government's responses strengthen accountability and transparency. Having said that, the government has still not provided any updates with respect to the 23 recommendations contained in our other seven reports, all of which are listed in our 2021 annual report. This is not, however, the only challenge that we have faced. As a committee, we also face three challenges in obtaining the information we are entitled to under the law and that we need to fulfill our mandate. As a committee, we also face three challenges in obtaining the information we are entitled to under the law and that we need to fulfill our mandate. First, several departments have cited reasons for not providing information that are outside the statutory exceptions found in the ENSICOP Act, such as inappropriately refusing to provide relevant emails or a departmental study. Second, several departments selectively refuse to provide information even though the information fell, fell within a request for information from the committee. And third, the committee is concerned that departments are applying an overly broad interpretation of what constitutes a cabinet confidence. If departments were required to inform the committee of how many and which relevant documents are being withheld and on what basis, it would help resolve these challenges. Indeed, this year we expect Parliament to begin a comprehensive review of the ENSICOP Act, which creates this committee. While we look forward to making specific recommendations about potential reforms of the Act to the designated committee at the appropriate time, drawn on seven years of practice. Today, I'd like to mention that the Act could be amended to improve the Committee's access to government information. In closing, I wish to say that all of our reports are the result of the 
incredibly dedicated work of my colleagues on the committee. The Cyber Defense Report is yet another example of a unanimous, nonpartisan review of a crucial government activity by a committee of security cleared senators and members of parliament from all major parties and a number of Senate groups. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. McGinty, and um, uh, that's a, uh, a, a telling final comment. So um, thank you. I'm sure it will, um, your presentation will provoke a lot of questions. Um, before proceeding to those questions, I would remind participants in the room to please refrain from leaning in too close to microphones or to remove your earpiece when doing so. This will avoid any sound feedback that could negatively impact committee staff in the room. Mr. McGinty, Senator Lankin, uh, Ms. Inman and Mr. Batia are with us today for one hour and to ensure that each member has time to participate, I'm going to limit each question, including the answer, to four minutes. Please keep your questions succinct and identify the person that you're ad addressing the question to. I offer the first question, as in the normal course, to our Deputy Chair, Senator Dagenet. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McGinty. This report, all of your reports, are extremely important. And I would like us to briefly speak of working procedures when you produce this type of report, for example, the one from 2019 that spoke of foreign interference. So I'd like to talk about security briefing. I think it's one of the most important aspects um, in governing a country, I'd like to know how the Prime Minister has been informed of the report and was he personally informed or was someone from his team more so briefed on this, on interference, and who was present during this briefing? Well, firstly, the committee doesn't take these decisions lightly when I speak of choosing a topic. There are criteria that we use in order to come to a final decision. And it's all members of the committee that participate in this decision. And then we go about this work with an extremely qualified team. We work with departments. We work with information available to us in terms of foreign interference. What I can say to you is that for this report, we had received more than 2,500 documents and 3,700 pages of information. And so we go through all of this, and then we set up a plan for us to follow for our study, and then we finalize the work. And when we do so, the report is sent to the Prime Minister as well as the corresponding minister. Minister. And it's sent in an unredacted manner. And then we begin negotiations, so negotiations between the committee and the government. There, we want to find out what information the government would like to remove. But this is all established in the law. Uh, on a willy-nilly basis, the Prime Minister does not sit upon receipt of an unredacted version with a black marker and blackout passages. This is an iterative process between the committee, the secretariat, and members of the government. And we are bound, of course, they are bound, of course, to redact on four core grounds, which are stated in the Act. Once the review is finalized, it is presented to the Prime Minister. Once the Prime Minister has a copy of the unredacted, unredacted version, I sit down with him and brief him for a period of time to walk through the details. Um, and the Prime Minister then takes the brief, will ask questions, might push back, might ask for more information. You should know, and I think the committee should know, and Canadians should know, wherever possible, the committee has always tended to, become, to be more transparent than less. Always. Pushing out for Canadians' benefit. So that's how the process, process works over time. 
And once it, of course, it is, it is redacted, then within a fixed period of time, it has to be tabled on the floor of the House and the Senate. Do I have the time for another question, Mr. Chair? Right. So we move on to Senator Richards, who will be followed by Senators Deacon, Gignac, Youssef, Cardozo, Dasco, and Boehm. Thank Richards. you very yeah. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here today, uh, Mr. McGinty. Uh, these are two very quick questions, and uh, they might have been answered somewhat in your prelim. Um, how fast are these malware attacks evolving? And how are we able to keep ahead of these attacks, or are we able to? And the second question is, you mentioned a too broad cavern, uh, cabinet conf confidence, uh, and I'm wondering how this might hamper security activities. Uh, I think the sp one of the things that the committee was struck with when it uh, came face to face with this challenge of cyber protection by the federal government was the the speed, the multiplicity, the different categories of actors, um, state, non-state, domestic, international, um, sometimes states, um, foreign state actors acting through um, criminal elements. Um, it turns out it's quite a sophisticated puzzle. Um, we know that one of the things that we came face to face with, I think it's fair to say, is the speed of change is accelerating. The speed of the challenge is ex accelerating. The complexity is accelerating. Um, with respect to cabinet confidence, the committee respects the need for cabinet confidence, understands cabinet confidence. There is a role for cabinet confidence. But... There have been a couple of instances where the committee has come face to face with information where we have been informed that it was a matter of cabinet confidence and then we found the information through other sources. And so we have gently but persuasively worked with the Privy Council Office and the Prime Minister's team to say, no, sorry, uh, you have to start working with us more openly and on behalf of Canadians, uh, they need to, to know as much as we can inform them. Of course, we're bound by the reality of dealing with highly classified information, where sources and methods have to be protected, where international relationships have to be protected, where those women and men who work in security and intelligence have to be protected. So I think we all accept that. I think Canadians accept that. But the cabinet confidence issue is one that's an organic, continuing uh, dialogue. Thank you. And, and as far as keeping up with uh, the, uh, the attacks by, say, Russia or China, we we're on par with that, or do you think uh, we have work to do, sir? I would say this on behalf of the committee. Uh, we were um, unanimous in concluding that Canada is um, a leader in and through its communication security establishment, shared service, the three main actors, Treasury Board Secretariat, we're uh, very fortunate to have evolved. And one of the things we did with the six case studies in this review is to illustrate the evolution and the iterative nature of where we've arrived at. You know, is, uh, you know I'm not in a position, the committee's not in a position to say that we can, we can deal with every and all and every sophisticated um, overture. But we have in front of us um, a very, very robust system. One which, for example, even the United Kingdom is now relying on from time to time. So Canada's work through CSE is actually a quite, gra quite groundbreaking and I think internationally recognized. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We now move on to Senator Deacon, Ontario. Thank you, uh, the chair, and thank you uh, all four of you being here today. And I welcome a uh, question I ask uh, to be answered. If it means across the table, that's fine. Again, um, I can still remember where I was when the report from 2019 uh, came out and the work of the committee with a high, as you said, degree of uh, intelligence and confidence is, is greatly appreciated. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Mr. McGinty, when you were speaking, that the recommendations from the Treasury Board, um, the policies and the services be extended to all uh, federal organizations, including Crown corporations. Last week, uh, I asked our witnesses that were here from CSE about this and was told essentially that the work is ongoing, 
but the sense I got was it was almost voluntary. That's what the sense was I got. And it's been some time since these committee recommendations uh, were made to the Prime Minister. So I'm wondering if you could give us a sense of why you think it, it's taking so long to get um, Crown Corporations under the TBS um, cybersecurity umbrella. And the possibility, you described a number of factors today, the possibility mm -hmm. that uh, some may not recognize the urgency of protecting their cyber systems. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll go first. Maybe mm -hmm. Senator Lincoln might want to chime in. Uh, with respect to why the government has not moved more quickly on these recommendations, that's a question you have to put to the government directly, and I encourage you to do so. Whether it's through DND or anyone else you'd like to call, whether it's the Treasury Board Secretary, for example, uh, who have a lot to say about this. What we have identified is uh, that um, being in the perimeter is better than not being in the perimeter. Being entirely in the perimeter is better than, not, than being halfway in the perimeter. Being outside the perimeter is a risk, not just to your own organization, Crown Corp or otherwise, but it's a risk to the entire federal uh, family of organizations. Um, we have listed how many are in, how many are out, how many are partly in or out. Um, and so we're, we're of the view that Canada ought to up its game uh, as a federal government. There's a lot of material here at risk, a lot of Canadians' personal data, military information, plans. Uh, this is uh, national security, or, you know, writ large. So we are uh, trying to illustrate through the study and through access to this information that we can really make improvements here. In many ways, that's why we only made two recommendations, not 20. Um, and so we're hopeful the government will move, and I would encourage you to call the Treasury Board Secretary to ask them that question. Senator? Thank you. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, relevant to remember within the, the uh, structure, and I'm talking about small p political, within um, relationships between departments and between central agencies, there are a lot of... Uh, issues that fall into this basket in terms of compliance, non-compliance, willingness to be brought in if you're not, um, <clears throat> uh, if it's not a compulsory uh, direction, and I think that's why the recommendation is so important that it become uh, compulsory. The uh, the reality in our structures in many departments and crown corps, the uh, authorities rest with the deputy and related to the the minister as well, but you know the. Fiscal decisions uh, that are taken, the allocation of resources that are taken, which is part of what we do in our framework reviews as well, you know, and some of the that we have done, look at how, um, what's the talk and then what's the walk, how does it match up. And in this report, we saw very clearly that there are gaps, and those gaps are dangerous for Canadians, they're dangerous for our national security, um, personal data, as the chair said. And I think that um, there is a willingness to move, but there's great reluctance and inertia at times within large departmental structures and the uh, interdepartmental relations. So uh, your voices uh, on this will be important, and uh, I agree with the chair. Calling Treasury Board is a very good idea. Thank you both. Thank you. Um, we now move to Senator Juniac. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Bien. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome to our witnesses, Mr. McGinty. In your report, you submitted February 8th, 2022, the report to the Prime Minister. Since then, things have really changed in the world. When we were in Brussels, some parliamentarians were saying that the week following uh, Russia's invasion in Ukraine, there had been a lot of cyber attacks. Now, Given what we've seen over the past year, speaking of Russia's different tactics, are there certain things in your report that you think you would have dug into a little bit more or things you would have uh, added to it since things have changed? Uh, Senator, it's a wonderful question, but the committee has not actually addressed this question since the report was tabled in the House. What is certain is that we know that foreign interference continues to this day, 
and there are no signs showing us that this will slow down. As a matter of fact, we do have indicators that show us that it is speeding up. But unfortunately, I'm not able to give you any more detailed information than that. In terms of Russia, in the report, we did, of course, talk at length of this country as well as on the topic of China and foreign interference. I think the other aspect of this is that, you know, the report talks about protecting government networks and systems, but with your experience, do you believe that there, because it's not just the f federal government, it's also the private sector. Do you think that there are countries that could be an example for us in order to establish a better coordination, coordination rather, between the government, universities, the private sector? Is there a sort of forum that exists in Canada in order to ensure this flow of information between stakeholders? Uh, not that we are aware of. I'm not sure if there is this type of forum. But I know that universities are more and more involved in this because there's the question of research and intellectual property. There is a lot more dialogue with provinces. And if this is the right word, we're able to detect these types of problems. And in the report, we gave some examples, some case studies. And we saw that in many cases, it's the CSE that actually identified a problem, notified it, and went to tell this, for example, Crown Corporation what was happening. And we've seen this with the Canadian Armed Forces. And so this is why we really like to hammer the idea that all federal organizations, all levels of the government need to be within this perimeter of security. And this would allow us to have a more uniform protection system. And I often forget the term for uh, the CSE in French, but they work a lot actually nowadays with the private sector. So there's a case study on a crown corporation and also one with a private company. And for the first time, they actually used CSE resources because it was a critical infrastructure sector. And this was the first case study in Canada that was mentioned and published in our report. Just to quickly make an additional point. Yes, I will. Thank you. Uh, well, the chair just raised it with respect to uh, the private sector and their role in critical infrastructure in this country. It is, to me, um, a critical issue that the communications is improved. CSE is doing an amazing job of reaching out. I would say CSIS uh, does now too in a much broader way, but they are hampered in what they can say. They can share resources and skills, but in terms of what they can uh, share in terms of their knowledge, uh, the national security uh, restrictions apply to them, and most people in the head of critical infrastructure organizations in the private sector do not have security clearance. That's true of our police forces too. So there are, there are issues that we have to come to terms with when we understand how pervasive this problem and this, the nature of these attacks are and where they can come from and where they can hit, which has equal you know, effect on our economy and our social well-being uh, as well as the, uh, the structures of government and its relationship to the people. So it's an important question that you raise. Mm -hmm. Thank yes. you very much. Uh, Senator Yusuf, you are next. Thank you, Chair. And let me thank you, uh, all of you, for, for being here on the report. Um, I guess the positive is the recommendation has been accepted by Treasury Board, so they're not fighting it, they're not arguing. So that's the good news. But what's more stunning, I guess, is the lack of at least some resistance by department to cooperate fully as you were conducting our, your report. I find it... Um, uh, quite um, 
challenging to get my head around that, given that I thought the department would want to know of their vulnerabilities and more importantly, reveal, um, um, I guess, what, what, what they made able to tell you to help improve the system, given that you know, you're a nonpartisan uh, committee. But given, the, uh, the, I guess, a desire to review the act, to figure out how we can bring that into consort so we have full review, um, I guess the timeliness of this is, is going to be very much uh, uh, something I see of, of priority for the government because the, the longer we wait for this to happen, the vulnerabilities are still there. So maybe, uh, Chair, through you, maybe some points you can reflect on about the need for this to happen. What, what do you see in terms of your, your thoughts? Well, one of the things we wanted to do through the, re the review was to uh, be practical uh, and grab the reader um, by the eyeball in the sense of um, we're going to illustrate what can happen. And that's why the six case studies, whether it's the China case study that targeted 31 departments with eight suffering severe compromises, TBS and finance were the worst affected, or study number two, the private company that's using CSE's abilities for the first time, or whether it's case study three, the heart bleed, attack on the Canada Revenue Agency, um, or number four, the National Research Attack Council attack by China, which cost us $100 million to repair, and we lost um, 40,000 files, or number five, the attack on DND, a state-sponsored actor, where significant amounts of data were stolen by DND, um, or finally, case study number six, perhaps the most worrisome for us in 2020, where a state had compromised the network of a crown corporation, and we believe it compromised not only a government department, but other departments as well. Um, all this so that the government of Canada could understand and those who are on the front lines of making these decisions at Treasury Board or CIOs of individual departments or crown corporations understand they could be next. They could be next. And um, buying shrink-wrapped technology off the shelf in trying to deal with this uh, unbelievably s sophisticated threat uh, may not be the, your, your best approach. So that's why we gave lift to these six case studies to say, if you might just see yourself in here as a government department or organization. Uh, and we hope that that will help, that help w would have helped to have grabbed their attention immediately. But as Senator Lincoln said earlier, I think the, the fact you're looking at this uh, you have an incredible voice and a role here, to uh, an opportunity to bring TBS, to the Tra Trade Board Secretary, in here and shared services and CSE again to say, well, okay, so where are we? How fast can you implement this? What's at risk? If I may, um, Very of course, quickly. cybersecurity is not just within the federal domain. It's private sector companies who are responsible for our information and more importantly, <laughs> a lot of data we share. But a province and municipality are equally vulnerable because they, should, they, they manage the infrastructure of this country. So in absence of knowing what's going on in the country, we have no le national legislation that anybody have to reveal cyber attack. Canadians know because it's in the media or your Rogers phone went out of service because um, you know, they didn't, the transfer of information, whatever, didn't happen. So I guess maybe two to seek your opinion. Do you think it's desirable for us to have some legislation that this information should be shared? Because if we're not aware of the, the volatility and the challenges we're faced with, how do we, as a country, come together to figure out how we're going to better work together? And, and the second one, uh, private companies, of course, are, are private companies, but they have an obligation uh, to the public to tell us things that we should have a database someplace that we should know because that should reveal, despite their best effort, that we're still vulnerable. Because if these, some of these companies shut down, they have major impact on what we do. Many of them are integral to the economy to a large extent. So if we don't know that, how do we protect the economy? I think, uh, I, I think the point you raise, and, and it uh, follows on um, Senator Gignac's point, uh, is is important, the answer of how we go about it is not something that our committee has discussed. And so I won't, you know, speak on, on behalf of the committee in any way with respect to that. But we, we do note, uh, not just in this report, but in our general um, review, uh, framework reviews and 
a couple of the activity reviews, um, we do note ourselves in our conversations that this is a, um, a significant problem in terms of a lack of coordination. Uh, I sat for a while on the board of uh, Hydro One, as you know, and you know the coordination there uh, of a North American grid, uh, the kind of security concerns for critical infrastructure. Uh, this committee itself in 2016 or 17 or so did a, a, a report. It's, it's almost quaint now, but you know, uh, pulse technology that could wipe out our communication systems. Uh, there's much more effective and advanced ways at this point in time. But those, those things are still real issues. And I think that those questions that you ask should be explored and to what, what extent uh, we could do that. I will just make two comments. CSE, and I said this before, um, CESA's, in, in the changes to CESA's legislation, uh, they were given, uh, enabled to do community outreach, uh, which they had been beginning to practice, but it was not clear what the legal foundation for that was. So the, that bill that came through the House of Commons and through the Senate and was passed changed that and, and provided uh, you know, provision and an enabling uh, process there for them. Uh, CSE has been proactive in reaching out. But all of those things are uh, you know, constrained by what I said in terms of the, uh, the one, resources, which is always going to be a case, but two, the, the nature of some of the information. Um, I think that the very question that you raise is one that should um, be given a thorough airing and a debate. I won't comment on my own personal opinions about it, but um, I am concerned about critical infrastructure. If I can get that one in there again. Thank you. Uh, and we now um, move on to Senator Cardoza. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for being here. I, I have a general question, and you can answer it to the extent that you can, understanding that, that, you, off, that you operate with a lot of confidentiality. Um, I, I think it, it, it probably intrigues a lot of Canadians as to how a committee like yours works, given that you come from par different partisan backgrounds, the House of Commons and the Senate. To the extent that you can, can you give us a sense of how you operate when people come to the table with different um, agendas? Is it somewhat like a committee, a House of Commons committee would work, or a Senate committee where people put their uh, priorities first and then you try and figure out what those priorities are? And then if you have time, if you could just share with us a little more your thoughts about why some of these agencies and departments are reluctant uh, to come under the umbrella. Um, I think the highest compliment the committee has likely ever received uh, was from officials who had appeared. <clears throat> and their feedback to us was, if you close your eyes and listen to the voice of the speaker, you had no idea from which political persuasion it was coming. Um, I think we found a way to work uh, together uh, in a nonpartisan, um, consensual way where we treat national security and intelligence the way we believe it ought to be treated. Uh, we have to remove, we, we remove it from the immediate cut and thrust of the arena. And those of us who have been involved in elected life know all about the cut and thrust of the arena. But these issues transcend any party, they transcend any government, uh, and we're certainly seeing that right now with some of the concerns Canadians are expressing around this discussion around foreign interference. So we work in a very consensual way. Our reports are poured over and deliberated at length, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, finding by finding, recommendation. If we can't get agreement, we go back and do it again. I will say this, in six years of practice, we've never once had to vote on anything. And it's important for Canadians to also know, and for you, Senators, to know, the government does not have a majority in the committee. It was designed not to have one. So um, it's more a question of, um, we think, putting the purpose and, and the importance of the issues front and center uh, to try and make improvements, to make recommendations for change to improve the situation. Uh, it's not easy. It's not easy. We're trying something new. It's never been done before and uh, in this country. And um, we seem to be making progress. We, we also generally don't enter into the fray um, of cut and thrust political debate. Um, we, we communicate when we have something to communicate. Today we think we have something to communicate. When we complete our next review on foreign interference, we'll have something to communicate. 
Um, and we remain, we remain disciplined because we are dealing with highly sensitive materials, and so we have to remain disciplined. Um, that's sort of how we work. We choose subjects using different metrics. Has it ever been examined before? Is it of interest to Canadians? How important is it? Is it public? Um, we can take a referred matters. A prime Minister or a Minister can refer a matter to us. It doesn't mean we're bound by it. We can take it under advisement. We can decline. We can accept. So the committee is very much independent. Um, and if, if it wants more information, it goes back and asks for more information. Um, there's never a shortage of information, by the way. It's, you know, 25, 30, 40, 50,000 pages of documentation per review. So it is a heavy load. There's no delega de delegation. You can't substitute um, an outstanding senator like Francis Lincoln. Well, you couldn't do it anyway, but the point being you can't, Francis can't, Senator Lincoln can't turn to somebody else and say, can you pinch hit for me today? No, this just, there's a reason why all the members are, are clear to a very high level um, and they commit and sign an oath and wave away the parliamentary privilege because of the nature of the work that goes on here. It's serious business. And so we, we try to meet, rise up to meet that challenge for Canadians. I would like to add, who's next. Mr. Chair, may I add just one quick comment? I know okay. it has to be very so, quick. Um, I, I think it's important to know that the chair, our chair went through some of the criteria. We also take a look at the way in which these issues um, implicate charter rights for Canadians. Uh, we look at issues of sovereignty and integrity of our institutions, uh, the economic societal impacts, and we we bring forward the departments, uh, sometimes individually, sometimes we've had, you know, grand uh, presentations that are across departments, but we reach outside of government as well for comments, so whether it's academics or whether it's people from um, particular NGOs who have an expertise in, in, in a subject and what the impact is on Canadians. That's part of our mandate is, as well. Well, there are, um, within the legislation, there are, you know, two types, a framework review and an activity review. Uh, all of that has to relate back to why we're doing this, which is for the Canadian public. And we try to speak in our reports in a way that can communicate to the Canadian public. And as the chair said, try to be as transparent as possible, uh, except for those areas that are actually dictated in the legislation that are exceptions uh, and that cannot be, uh, must be redacted. Thank you. Santa Daska. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, witnesses, for being here. I, um, I, I want to pursue the topic of, um, of the, uh, the kind of information that the committee is entitled to receive and really the granularity of the information. You receive information briefings from departments, from the CSE, from other sources, but um, how entitled are you to ask for information that is really granular, that has to do, let's, let's say, with individuals or particular specific situations that might even go beyond the case studies that you have in your report? And Mr. McGinty, since you uh, use the term foreign interference, I'm going to pick up on that. Open the door, did I? You opened the door, yes, yes, just, just in time uh, for me to um, <laughs> ask you to, um, uh, to, to pursue that topic in terms of, again, the granularity of the information. Can you ask for information about individuals um, who may have been targets of attacks or situations, um, uh, notwithstanding the fact that departments are blocking some of the information, as you said earlier, the information you're looking for, notwithstanding that, what are you entitled to, to receive? How, how far down can you go? How extensive is the information you can request and hope to receive? The, I think the first thing to remember is that we're a review committee not an oversight committee. So we, there are some restrictions in terms of the kinds of information we can request in terms of timeliness. For example, we can't uh, ask for details on ongoing investigations. Uh, but if I can ask Lisa Marie Inman to answer you in the granularity, she's perhaps best placed because um, she's often negotiating and following through with the information owners. So thanks very much for the question. Um, in terms of granularity, there's really no limit as to 
the degree of granularity we can seek in our requests for information. There is, of course, certain information that we're not entitled to, uh, notably information about an ongoing investigation, law enforcement investigations that may result in prosecution, um, sort of human source information, witness protection program information, and uh, cabinet confidence. But as to the granularity, it can really be any information at all that is relevant to our review. And we very regularly see very granular information. Uh, I will make the point, though, that you know, often we will get in information about individuals, but the committee doesn't have an individual complaint mandate. Um, so folks can't come to the committee to complain about their particular situation. So there won't be a lot of occasions where we would look into, say, someone's individual case. Um, there are sort of other mechanisms for that. Um, but, and I will say that generally speaking, you know, we, we have raised some challenges to getting particular types of information. I think cabinet confidence was the sort of one thing that the chair did highlight, but generally speaking, um, we've found that departments and agencies, particularly over the time that the committee has existed, over the five years, it has evolved a fair bit. Um, and there is a, really a relationship of trust now with the security and intelligence community. Uh, in terms that I think, I don't want to speak for them, but uh, they are confident that the committee can take the appropriate measures to safeguard their information. Um, they're generally forthcoming and cooperative in the information that they provide. You know, other than these specific uh, instances that the chair described where we have had issues, it's generally uh, a fairly seamless process being able to get information. And as the chair said as well, we'll often get information, look at it, and realize that you know, something is referred to in this document or that document that we don't have before us. So it's an iterative process of request for information. We'll often get information and then ask for more information, um, you know, several times up until the very end of a review. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, you're getting blocked in a lot of the requests you're getting or some of the requests. That's what I understood from the remarks that, that say that the departments are resisting uh, they're refusing information. Um, I think, all, Senator, I think only in certain cases. We don't uh -huh. want to overstate that case. Okay. It's, generally good. it's generally very, very good. We've cultivated a strong relationship. And in some cases, for example, after performing the DND Canadian, Canadian Armed Forces review of their security and intelligence activities, it actually led or helped lead to the creation of a review office inside the department to be able to start sharing information in a forthcoming way with us in the future or NCIRA, the agency, or someone else, some other group. So uh, we don't want to overstate the case. There have been a couple of instances where we have been very firm about information, and we're working our way through that. And uh, we don't expect to face many of those, to be honest. I don't think we expect to face that very often in the future. Thank you very much. We're going now to Senator Beam, followed by Senator Boivano. Senator Beam. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair, and uh, I'd like to thank the witnesses uh, for being here, and it's great to have Senator Lankin back with us, even in a witness capacity. Um, I'll be in the chamber tomorrow. Excellent. Um, I uh, have a number of, uh, of questions, and I think I'll just put them all out there, recognizing that uh, I have only a few minutes, and I don't think we're going to have much of a round two. So... Um, Mr. McGinty, you mentioned the cyber defense perimeter uh, a number of times, and I think most people, when they think of a perimeter, they think of a fence. And I, I know you're referring to something that's much more elastic. Uh, we have, as Canada, over 150 uh, offices abroad, whether embassies, uh, consulates, uh, offices of embassies, and, and the like. And the provinces also have, have some abroad as, uh, as well. When you speak about the cyber defense perimeter and perhaps its weakest link, it's conceivable that the weakest link could be far away from our shores and we would have to have the electronic cyber protection to ensure that. Um, so that's, uh, that's one question. I'd like your thoughts on, uh, on that. Uh, the other is, um, I know uh, yours is a review committee. Uh, other parliaments among the five eyes have similar sorts of uh, committees. Is there any back and forth or any discussion on best practices uh, since uh, NSCOP has been uh, operating for, uh, for some time? And are the reports shared? Do you get inputs? Uh, that sort of thing. And my last question is really to you. As a, as a parliamentarian, 
you know well how many meeting requests we receive from embassies, from, uh, from lobbyists. As chair of this particular uh, review committee, do you feel you're getting uh, attention yourself? And if so, how would you handle that? I'm not sure what kind of attention you mean. <laughs> Popularity. Popularity. Well, Entre guillemets. <clears throat> Let me start with the last question first. Uh, maybe uh, there's... I, I, I find I, I've had to... I think all members have found that we've had to govern ourselves a bit differently now that we sit on this committee in terms of meetings and uh, attending... Um, diplomatic settings. As a general rule, I, I don't anymore. Um, I tend to um, be very careful. Um, or if I'm traveling, I'm very careful and so on and so forth. I think most of us have been briefed and briefed yet again about those risks. Um, on the question of um, how we share information or how we conduct our practice and are there other groups? Yes, we have liaised with the Intelligence and Security Committee in the UK. Lisa Marie led a delegation there just uh, last January. It had a week of meetings. We've had the ISC members from Britain here to Canada previously. We're hoping to get to Britain at some point. They have a longer tradition in that practice and that approach. Uh, we've learned a lot from them. We've met with the New Zealanders. We've met with Australia. We've met with some U.S. counterparts. Um, and then we've also had many overtures from other countries in the world asking how we're doing this, Romania, um, Israel, um, South Africa, saying, can you share your know-how in terms of what you're doing here because we're looking for models that might be appropriate for us. So we're finding our way forward. Um, and I guess on your first question, I'm going to ask if I could, Nabil Vachia, on the details about the about the, um, the technical side of this. Sure. Thank you very much for your question, Senator Beam. Um, so when we're speaking about the cyber defense perimeter, uh, we're speaking about three tools that are operated by CSC. Uh, and we outline these tools from paragraphs 188 to 202 in our report. So I understand not too long ago you spoke to Mr. Khoury and Quiard from uh, the Canada Center for Cybersecurity, so they can speak to this uh, with, with much authority. Uh, the three types of sensors employed by CSC are network-based sensors, host-based sensors, and cloud-based sensors. So these three sensors work together at the network level, at the host level, which is on actual endpoint devices, and at the cloud level to complement commercially available measures such as firewalls and antiviruses. And they serve two purposes. So on the one hand, they identify malicious cyber activity. On the other hand, they, they proactively defend networks against cyber attack. Uh, sens sensors constantly monitor for anomalous cyber activity, analyze that activity to identify new malicious cyber behavior, and then CSC uses this information to mitigate threats in the present and plan for threats in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. And uh, we finish this round with Senator Boivin. And the lucky guy. Merci beaucoup. Bienvenue. Thank you very much. Welcome, David. Welcome, Senatrice. You know, right now we're studying security in the Arctic. And what I have found, I would say us, but I'm, I'll just speak for myself, is that according to the President of the United States through NORAD, Canada is not in a very good position in terms of protecting ourselves in the Arctic from players such as Russia. So one thing that was noticed is that the Canadian Armed Forces personnel and material are in a poor state. In your 2022 report, you spoke of the government's cyber defense, of information theft, in the military domain, which could reveal strategies, for example. This is an important part of our study. So could you say more about the government's contribution to the military environment in terms of 
equipment, for example, and as well as our ability to manage cyber attacks, this entire file, given the lack of resources and equipment that we have? How do we prevent these cyber attacks? Because this requires a lot of resources and equipment. So what can you say about the government's position and how far behind we are with the Canadian Armed Forces? I was going to ask Nabil because he's, uh, he's looking at me like he has something that he wants to say, no. so no, no, okay. Um, <laughs> first of all, um, I think I'm correct in the way I'm, the words that I'm using, DND monitors their own cybersecurity, so they have a, um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a different organization, it's a different culture, and uh, the imperatives um, are different in their use of, uh, of cybersecurity monitoring as uh, implications in the field on the front line. So, you know, it's, a, it's quite, uh, quite different. I think that the, um, the, the issues of resources, I mean, this is, is something that I understand your committee may be looking at in, in, in deeply. Um, we didn't do a standalone review of D&D with respect to cybersecurity. Uh, we would include them in the general recommendations that all should be inside the same perimeter and that the resources of CSE should be more um, widely utilized. Uh, but the question that you raised with respect to the resources available would uh, in entail us doing a framework review to look at the administrative, um, legislative, regulatory, and financial uh, administration pieces of this, which we have not done at this time, uh, at this uh, point in time. But it is, um, a, again, these are good questions that are being asked. And one of the things that I was saying, in, in addition to what the chair said earlier about how we, we have criteria for what we review and how we make our decisions and how the committee works to come to uh, those decisions, uh, every time we do a review, uh, by the end of it, we have thoughts about what we need to go back on in an appropriate um, manner of time, making sure it's review and not oversight. But uh, there, are, this has been seven years. It's been seven years of learning. It's been seven years of learning for the government and departments who have never had this kind of interaction with parliamentarians before. And while it took a while, I concur with the comments that have been made that generally we have excellent relationship, trust-based relationship, and there's been a good exchange of information. The question of D&D &D and how that may be done is uh, warrants a review, and whether it is by this committee or at some time in the future, if NS, uh, NCCOP decides to do that, um, th that would be helpful because those questions that you've asked are important, and I would say in particular uh, with respect to the foreign interference file and the Arctic at this point in time. Um, Very quickly. Yes, Mr. McGinty, you spoke a lot about your exchanges with other countries. <laughs> Has, have these exchanges given you new ideas that could help Canada improve its cyber threat protection performance? La uh, documentation. We often receive documents, for example, from the UK. They've had this type of committee for decades. We share wherever we're able to. Of course, we cannot share classified documents. But we do have a partnership and we work together and learn from each other. But that being said, we are different because different countries have a different structure. It's different in Australia, in New Zealand. Um, the Prime Minister is actually the president of the committee in some situations. But in any case, I think that people are more and more interested by the topic of cyber attack. And I know that the U.S. is currently negotiating one or two uh, agreements on the topic. If you will indulge me for one more minute, I have a quick question to ask you to add to those that you've received. You mentioned, uh, Chair, CSE engaging in proactive defensive operations, I think is the term that you use. 
D does that extend to measures that would um, degrade a known assailant's ability to attack our critical infrastructure? I'm not sure, Mr. Chair, that's... I'm not sure if you're deliberately trying to be difficult or what here. <laughs> Um, I'd, have to, I'd have to try to answer that question. I understand. I'd, I'd have to go through this this review a bit more carefully to answer it carefully for you. Thank you. Thank um, you. That's but, that's um, fine. That's that's great. Thank you. And um, this brings us to the end of the panel, and um, I'd like to extend our thanks to you, Mr. McGinty, to um, to Senator Lankin, who we are delighted to see here with us, to Ms. Inman and Mr. Batia. We we greatly appreciate the time. Uh, and the contributions um, uh, and the time you've taken to, uh, to share your experience with us. And we thank you for your work on NCCOP. Uh, and we know that is taken on in addition to your day jobs, to um, the other weighty responsibilities that you have. Uh, we're grateful for the work that you do, uh, all of you. And um, we thank you, I thank you, on behalf of the committee of the Senate of Canada and, um, and on behalf of Canadians. And uh, we, we wish you well in the important work that you, uh, that you will do in the future. So thank you very, very much. And we will now suspend briefly before resuming in camera for the remainder of the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>